here at the Corcoran. Um, all right, so thank you all for coming tonight to Under the Influence. I'm Lisa Gold. I'm the director of Washington Project for the Arts. And uh, we are a membership organization that supports artists living and working in the DC region. And we, um, we helped organize the event tonight, uh, along with Sharon Burton and Holly Bass and uh, Blake Kimbrough and the Corcoran Contemporaries and the excellent program staff here at the Corcoran. So Aaron and everybody, thank you for that. Um, this program tonight, Under the Influence, it was conceived in response to uh, some of the, the central organizing principles of this exhibition. Um, ideas of identity, artistic community, legacy, and highlighting those relationships between artists across generations. So we thought this program would be a great way to, um, to illustrate that principle and involve um, our, our community, our artist community, in this exhibition. So um, through an open call, we invited artists to submit um, a short presentation um, about the influence of the 30 American artists on their work. And our esteemed juror, John Bankston, um, was so impressed uh, with the artists that he, he could not choose 10. He chose 11 artists to present tonight, so we get a bonus artist, 10% more art tonight. We have um, 11 artists who will be presenting tonight. Um, so here's how it's going to work. Uh, uh, Sarah Newman is going to introduce John Bankston, and he's going to speak about his work and his artistic influences. Um, and then each of the 11 artists will talk for five minutes about their work. And it's going to go really fast, so everybody pay attention. Um, and then we'll open up for a, a brief Q&A after that. Um, and then everyone's invited to uh, view the exhibition, and there'll be a reception out front. So um, I want to thanks, thanks to you all for coming. Um, and again, thanks to the Corcoran for hosting this event, um, and to Blair Murphy, our WPA's program director, for helping, helping me organize this, and of course to our very generous juror, John Bangston, um, and, and so many other people here who helped make this program happen tonight. Uh, so now, let me introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Newman. Sarah is the Curator of Contemporary Art at the Corcoran, um, where she's curated the Now at the Corcoran series, which has included Spencer Finch, My Business with the Cloud, and Chris Martin, Painting Big. And most recently, she was the organizing curator of 30 Americans. So I give you Sarah Newman. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, and thanks to Lisa and the Washington Project for the Arts for organizing this event along with um, the Corcoran and um, one of the subcommittees of our 30 Americans um, um, organizing committee, um, as well as the Corcoran Contemporary. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, and I know we've been looking forward to this event for a long time. Um, I think a program like this one, in which local artists come and talk about their work and talk about what it means and where it comes from, is something, um, it's a kind of event that just seems to make sense um, and something we're all really interested in, but actually it's pretty rare. Um, and it's kind of special when it actually occurs. Uh, it's something we'd like to see more of at the Corcoran, and we thought it really was the perfect time to do it now, um, as Lisa was saying, because this exhibition, 30 Americans, is all about um, that process, the process of artists learning from artists and the way um, style and formal strategies and ideas kind of wind their way through generations and, and ripple out um, outward. Um, so it's something that's really um, core to the show. So again, I'd like to thank the WPA, um, as well as American Express, who have supported um, the entire lecture series and programming series um, <clears throat> associated with 30 Americans. But mainly, I would like to thank John Bankston and welcome him here tonight. John is one of the artists featured in 30 Americans, and I hope you all have the chance to see his um, work displayed upstairs. Um, and he's selected all the artists who will be presenting the work tonight. And once you know a bit of John's work, you'll recognize it immediately. It's based in the visual language of children's coloring books and has a wonderful, bold, graphic sensibility sort of in between painting and drawing. And while its pictures look simple on their surface, they're really anything but, and they spin out these complex tales of adventure and science fiction and danger while exploring issues of race and sexuality and power and narrative. John's work is in the collections of several major museums, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, and SF MoMA. <clears throat> and he's had exhibitions all over the world including at the Studio Museum, the Andy Warhol Museum, and a one artist show at the De Young Museum in San Francisco where he's currently living and working. 
He's received numerous awards, um, some from the Society for the Encouragement of Contemporary Art at SFMOMA and the Joan Mitchell Foundation and many others. And, you know, I think as Lisa was saying, um, John chose 11 artists tonight instead of 10 artists, as was his brief. And I think that sort of speaks to his um, generosity and um, kind of his generosity of spirit, but also to the quality of the work that we're going to be seeing tonight. So I think it's, it, it bodes very well. And it's sort of like, it's, it's very much like 30 Americans. There are actually 31 artists and 30 Americans. So <laughs> it's kind of part of the theme. Um, so tonight, John will be talking to us about his work and who and what has inspired it. And he'll kick off the entire evening of artists musing on influence. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you, Sarah. So tonight's program is about influence. And um, the idea of influence for artists is very important because um, none of us come fully formed. We're all a product of the things that we see around us, things that speak to um, our spirit and, um, uh, think, and the way we want to um, express ourselves. And um, also, you know, the idea of influence, looking at um, other works of art or other artists or objects um, and taking bits of information and piecing that together to form our own visual language is a way of sort of having a conversation with, the, with that work. And I think, you know, conversations are very important um, in art. So I'd like to start just by giving you a little background um, on myself, on me, and then I'll show some slides of um, work uh, from my collection that um, is, has influenced my work. And then um, I'll show you some um, work from the last couple of years. Um, I started off as an undergraduate studying biology at the University of Chicago um, with the intention of um, going to medical school. But my last couple of years, I uh, started taking art classes. And um, I discovered that people actually went to school to study art. And that um, I started meeting um, art students and uh, going to galleries in Chicago. And um, became really interested in a group of artists um, that were known as the Chicago Images. Um, and so a after I finished undergraduate school, I um, decided to, um, much to my family's dismay, take a year off and um, prepare a portfolio to apply to art school. Um, and um, I went, ended up going to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I really wanted to go to that school because um, many of the um, Chicago images were teaching there. And one of the biggest influences on my work um, was uh, one of my teachers, Ray Yoshida, who was a member of the, the Images. And Ray was influential because he exposed me to, he was, he was a, an artist and a collector of um, African art, outsider art, um, folk art, and just interesting objects. And he uh, introduced me to, to that kind of art. Um, I really had no idea about um, folk art or outsider art uh, or really even African art or art of other cultures. And um, I would go with Ray on, sa on Saturdays once a month outside of Chicago. There was this uh, big flea market and it was really like an extra class because it wasn't just about looking for things but it was about looking at things and um, looking at how things were constructed and the color and sort of the references that they had. And so he was really interested, um, interested in the sort of, uh, he called it the visual. So anything that was sort of excited you visually. Um, and he really um, instilled in me the idea that there are a lot of ways to make art, a lot of ways to make painting, and a lot of ways to communicate. This is his painting, Them, from uh, 1994. Another one of my teachers who was very influential was um, Don Baum. Um, Don was uh, an artist and a curator. And actually, he was uh, the person who um, 
uh, curated most of the um, images shows at an art space in Chicago in Hyde Park called the Hyde Park Art Center. Um, and Don was also interested in outsider art, but he was also very interested in contemporary art and um, very interested in surrealism and um, the sort of psychological implications of images. And uh, this is a piece of his, he um, would collect these, um, he, he used a lot of found materials. And these are paint by number paintings that he um, collected and um, cut, cut together, I mean cut and collaged together. And these are, this is actually one piece, but it's two-sided. And another um, influence on my work was Robert Colescott, whose work I discovered while I was in art school. Um, I just really love the way he was able to combine painting and drawing, which is something I really want to strive to do in my work. And also this, the collage of space. He has very complex and intricate space um, compilations in his work. And also this um, sort of um, brash sense of humor, I think, is, um, is something I really enjoy. Um, I'm also very interested in um, African masking traditions. Um, this is um, a yaka mask. It's a... Um, um, it's an initiation for young boys wear this mask, as well, or also can be called a circumcision mask. Um, but um, what really interests me in the idea of masking is uh, I'm very also very interested in what I call performative dress. And in San Francisco, you see a lot of that. Um, and and I, I like the idea uh, that the African mask, um, the masks are actually these, uh, the spirits that live outside the village, in the bush. And the bush is where all the wild things are, where the spirits are. Um, and the, um, it's the, actually the villagers who go out into the bush and become these spirits and come back into the, into the village and dance the, the, the dance for the mass. And I've, I've sort of incorporated this idea in my work. Um, I sort of feel what my, my work is about is it's, it's a visual novel that um, kind of goes uh, from each show is a new chapter. But it takes place in what I call rainbow forest, which I think of as the bush. I feel like it's, it's also sort of like San Francisco. Um, it's it's uh, where the characters go to become um, these uh, characters of their secret desires. Um, these are um, called colonial figures. Um, they're from Ghana. Um, these are contemporary. They're not old. But uh, the figures originally were used to um, portray sort of archetypes. Um, these are like two students and their headmaster. Um, but what I really love about them is the way the, f the use of the form the figure is one sort of abstract shape. And I also like the idea of the using, using archetypes. Um, in my work, I'm, I'm interested in the visual language of coloring books. And coloring books um, use sort of symbols and um, archetypes to, to uh, get across information about um, what type of character that is. Um, I like the using. I like the idea of, of of coloring books because it's something we've all experienced. It's our first um, experience as visual creators, and um, so. Uh, and also, these um, sculptures um, were my model when I started making sculptures a couple years ago. Um, these are um, barbershop signs from Africa. Um, and what I love about these is the inventiveness of the drawing. Um, 
it's, it sort of reminds me of um, Robert Colescott and his inventive figuration. Um, and also, I like the idea that these are, these are sort of fantastic um, hairdos and that these are um, things that you could actually, you know, go in and say, I want that one. And so you can become, you know, you could be transformed. And I really like the idea of transformation. I, I think um, that's a big um, part of uh, my work. And so now I'll show you some slides of um, my work from the um, last couple of years. So I, I, as I mentioned, I um, think of my work as a visual, an ongoing visual novel. It's not written, it's all um, um, images. And um, each, each show or each, um, yeah, basically each show is like another chapter. Um, and sometimes I forget the, um, you know, the actual story of each chapter, but the, the sort of overall arc of the, the, the uh, narrative is that um, the main character, Mr. M, has been captured and taken to um, this place I call Rainbow Forest. And he's left there and he has to make his way through, the, through this new world and he encounters all these different characters who are sometimes um, help him, who sometimes help him and sometimes hinder his progress. Um, I'm really interested in the, um, trying to use um, characters um, that you might find in a coloring book, but also to think that the characters' outfits or costumes would be something that would be very easy for uh, someone to, um, to make. I like the, like in African um, masks, sometimes they're very simple, it's like just enough to um, change the, um, the person from being a, an everyday villager to one of the spirits. So, and in the in the in my work, I use very a kind of a limited range of characters. I like that there are. I sort of think of it almost like a TV show, where you have like maybe four or five characters, and you see them every week, and they're kind of engaging in these different um, in these different stories. And. Um, a couple years ago, well, I guess a year ago, I started making um, these ceramic sculptures. And I was really, I really liked the colonial figures. What I love about them, you know, not only is, is just this, the abstract form of the figure, but also this combination of sculpture and painting, because they're all painted. And so I knew I wanted to make um, ceramic sculptures that were painted rather than glazed. I sort of like the feeling of them. I think that gives them almost a feeling, a childlike quality, um, but also uh, it makes them very tactile and um, um, you sort of can see the, uh, the, the, the shape of the figure and it allows me to, to kind of play with the idea of painting and drawing and this sculpting. This, this one, the, um, the hat is um, uh, acrylic on linen. I've been really interested in this idea of um, this horse that is like a costume for two people. So um, it's like this idea of partnership. Um, they both like come together to to make this one creature.
Um, then I became very interested in this idea of exploring rainbow forest. And I've been, I've sort of used um, um, places in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park as my um, reference point. So I wanted to sort of have like the figure in nature. Um, and then I had the show in Birmingham, Al Alabama, and um, um, I, I went down, there was a, a still, still mill there, and it's now a park. And I was just really amazed by these large machines and by the, um, the sort of hellish feeling of this, of this place. And, um, I kind of wanted to use this idea of, um, of machines that sort of invaded um, rainbow forest and how they would, what they, the impact that they would have. So um, in this series, uh, there are three characters who sort of conspire to make this machine that when any of the characters look at it, it, it changes them. And I called the, the machines the abstracticators. These are um, um, all work on paper. It's um, acrylic on paper. And also, there was an, in, an invasion of rabbits, and some of them were blue. <laughs> So a lot was going on at that time with the Rainbow Forest. Um, this was an installation of uh, a large painting and, um, and three um, ceramic sculptures. Um, the, uh, I was sort of, I, I think that there, there's this element of drama, I think, in, um, in the work. Um, just because all the characters are sort of dressing up. And so I, I, wanted, to, um, I wanted this to sort of feel like an old um, theatrical backdrop. And um, this is the magician who's just shrunken the, uh, the other characters. And then these are uh, more of this idea of the, these sort of theatrical backdrops. Um, these are a little bit smaller. Um, those were like three feet tall, and these are about 16, 12, 16 inches tall. And um, the backdrop is, and the um, stage are painted with acrylic. And the sculpture ceramic and acrylic. And then these are just a slight variation of that. Um, these are the these are abstracticate. This is an abstracticator, and um, it's um, the backdrop is painted, and the the sculpture is um, this kind of polymer, kind of like a polymer clay, and um, and it's painted. And then these backdrops are acrylic on um, linen, and the sculptures are also the polymer clay. And these are the three characters who, um, who get together to make the abstracticator, and this is their final product, and they're very proud. And this is some new work. Actually, I've just finished for a show that I have coming up in San Francisco in December. And um, these are more, um, more abstracticators, but now they've gotten bigger. And um, 
they're starting to sort of pollute the air and um, so the, the air is um, kind of murky and um, the characters, um, this is another abstracticator. The characters are growing these beards and these, and these odd um, hairstyles. And the show is called Smoke and Mirrors. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you. And I'd just like to, um, to thank the Corcoran and uh, Washington Project for the Arts for um, allowing me to look at um, all the great work. You have, seem to have a very strong artistic community here in DC, so you should be very proud. And, um, and now we'll see some examples of that. Okay, so I'm going to um, introduce each artist um, before they come up. So um, first up is Cedric Baker. And Cedric is a member artist at Workhouse Art Center in Lorton, Virginia. He works in a wide range of media, including painting, drawing, photography, and video. Um, Cedric studied at the Pratt Institute and Sacramento City College. He's a past participant in the State Department's Art and Embassies program, and Cedric is going to be talking about the influence of Carrie James Marshall on his work. So, Cedric. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. The first work I'm showing, well, let me tell you something about my, uh, how I began. I'm originally from North Carolina, and uh, this painting speaks to race, and that's one of the things that I took from Kerry Marshall, is his uh, approach to putting race in his work. And this painting is titled The Drinking Fountain, and if you know about Jim Crow in the South, it was a segregated drinking fountain. Also, this is some of the first figurative work that I did after working in a very large-scale color field painting style. The medium here is oil and encaustic on canvas, and that's hot wax. This is one of the figures that I painted down in North Carolina. I spent a lot of time in New York City also. Some of the paintings that you'll see is from a series that I call the New York Club Scene. And I think some of it's going to be coming up soon. This is one of the paintings from New York Club Scene. <clears throat> it's a self-portrait with two graffiti artists. And it's very large scale. It's about seven by six feet. And it's all in encaustic on canvas. And what I would do, I would take photographs in the clubs in New York, and from some of this work, I would turn into paintings. This is one of the paintings. Strangely enough, I have never shown the photographs. It isn't until recently I looked through the photographs and put together a video and, and put it on YouTube, and I got a lot of response from it. So I'm looking forward to showing the paintings and the photographs together for the first time. This is the painting that was on loan to the uh, arts and the embassies, and I just got it back from Djibouti, Africa, and it's called the Duke, uh, DC Zone, Duke Ellington. I work in a fairly expressionistic style, I guess you could see that, and um, Again, uh, I like the influence that Kerry Marshall brings to his work. If you know his work, you know he uses a very uh, black, iconic figure. And that's what got my attention when I first saw his work in magazines. 
and I went to the Brooklyn Museum and saw the work that he did, which was a combination of media photography and uh, video as well as painting and drawing. And I, I try to strive to include all that in my work. This painting is called Mistaken Identity. And again, I've reduced everything to a sort of minimal ge geometric form. And I still do portraits. This was a commissioned portrait. I've always wanted to uh, include African sculpture in some kind of way in my work. And this is me getting away from the uh, figure and using sort of an abstract uh, object in a minimal, uh, again, form. And music has been a big influence on me as well. So, and, and being in the clubs, and a lot of times you see a lot of uh, entertainers. So, this was a band that I photographed and, and did this painting. Small club scenes. This painting is in the collection of the uh, DC Arts Commission and Humanities, the Art Bank. And the scale is probably 30 by 40 inches. More New York club scenes. I call this painting B-Boys. And uh, it was ironic that at that time, there was so much happening in New York with the graffiti and the rap movement and the new wave in art. This is a small piece that I combined watercolor and drawing for the first time. And I really liked it. I've always drawn a lot. And I really liked the uh, combination and the mix of watercolor and drawing. And over the summer, I saw a, a drawing show with uh, Kara Walker, who really impressed me, the way she used charcoal and gave me a new sense of what you could do with drawing. So I'm in the process of doing quite a bit of drawing now. But these are scenes from the South. Like I say, I spent a lot of time in North Carolina. That's where my mother retired to, so I'm down there quite a bit. And I go to New York quite a bit. And I recently returned back to minimal color field painting. And the title of this piece is Coffee with Matisse. This painting is called Moot Indigo. And this is from within. I, when I do these paintings, I look at them as just object. It's just painting on canvas. And it's, uh, it can med cause a, a meditative uh, environment. But I just like color. And this is a very recent uh, oil painting I did. I photographed a group of kids that I did a workshop with over in Southeast. And I started to do paintings from the photographs. Hopefully I'll show all this work at uh, the Manassas Art Center, I'm scheduled to show there next November. So this is the last one. And again, thank you for coming out. Okay. Um, uh, I'm just going to remind all the artists to watch our lovely timekeeper there. Diana is working very hard to make sure we all stay on schedule here. Um, so next up is Tom Block, and Tom is a writer and an artist. His work has been included in recent exhibitions at Pyramid Atlantic Art Center, uh, the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies in Washington, and Gallery of Faro in New Jersey, as well as Hamiltonian artists. Um, he has an upcoming retrospective at um, the Mission Gallery in San Francisco, and he will speak about the influence of Jean-Michel Basquiat on his work. Tom? Thank you very much. I just um, will uh, briefly speak about how um, Jean-Michel Basquiat became an influence. I was in art school from uh, 1989 to 1981, and it was right at the end of the incredible 
art market era, for those of you that remember that, when anything put on a wall in New York would sell. And um, the kind of artists that I was looking at were like Julian Schnabel, David Solly, Keith Haring, Eric Fischel, Deborah Butterfield, Judy Chicago. And, and quite frankly, none of them uh, touched me. I felt like they didn't have an artistic voice so much as a gimmick. They sort of found a, a marketing style and then they would stick with it. I'm Michelle Basquiat and I was uh, deeply, um, uh, deeply touched by his, and this is after he'd passed away, I was just talking about his art, not his, his story, but deeply touched by the passion, by the sense of color, by the way he used paint, by the way he used the color stick, everything about the visual work. And I, um, I looked at his work a lot over this couple of years, and then I forgot about him, quite frankly. And then uh, in 2006 and 2007, without me thinking about him, he reemerged. And that, um, I think it says a lot about artistic influence, that something that had been dormant within me came out. And even then, I didn't think about it. It was only when I saw the call for this show, and I looked through the 30 or 31 artists here, that I remembered uh, Basquiat, and I, I actually saw this deep influence. So I'm going to show a series, two different series of paintings from 2006 and 2007, and I think uh, there's a pretty clear influence that is um, evident, even though it was not at the time that I was painting, in my head. It was in my, uh, I guess you would say, heart and artistic soul. So the first series is um, taken from a series of 85 mystics. They're all four feet by two feet. Uh, the first one is Alter Ego Mystic, um, Bunny Rabbit Mystic, and I think uh, you can see another influence here, perhaps, the Bunny Rabbit. So this is post facto. Um, this whole series is, is looking at mysticism and looking at what I consider um, contemplative mystic here, and, and a mistaken idea that we can somehow, as humans, approach uh, the God consciousness. Um, this is Disappointed Mystic. Um, I've done a lot of reading about mysticism, and it always strikes me that there is a gulf there that we will not cross until uh, our time comes, and that the idea that you can actually get there while you're alive is mistaken. This is fleeing mystic. This mystic is fleeing from desire. Generally, I flee to desire. Another way I don't believe in mysticism. God's Green Acre mystic. A little bit of doughboy influence there in addition to uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Indignant mystic. Um, lovable mystic, that's a self-portrait. Perp Walk Mystic, also a self-portrait, but not enough time to tell you the story, thankfully. And Politically Adept Mystic. Again, there are 85 of these. And then um, in 2006, I went to New York, and I had a three-month residency at Cooper Union in um, Lower East Side. And I was painting probably about a five-minute walk from where Basquiat painted. And this is really when Basquiat kind of came out of me. And this painting is 72 feet long, and this is on, uh, on uh, loan to the American Institute of Contemporary German Studies at 17th and Mass. It's up right now. And it's, it's a huge painting, and I just, I literally spat this thing onto the canvas working from about 8 in the morning until midnight in these Lower East Side studios at Cooper Union. And um, this is probably about 18 feet of it. A again, I was not thinking about Basquiat, but it seemed that a lot of his color usage and his imagery and um, some of his visual ideas and hopefully some of his visual passion uh, began to emerge onto the canvas. And it was, a, it was probably the most passionate time I ever had painting because I was so completely involved in the act of painting. And I think that's really uh, what it was about Basquiat that touched me was that that act of painting is so clear in his work. You know, they say that the greatest paintings look as if they were painted yesterday, no matter how old they are. And certainly Basquiat is, I think, in that category. And um, in my mind, he's up there with people like de Kooning and Gustin and Frank Auerbach and sort of my most important painters. So I think, oh, there's a couple more. These are small detail, about two by three feet of the 72 foot painting um, to give you an idea of some of the work that went on Seven, six, five, and uh, thank you all very much. That's it.
Thank you, Tom. Um, next up is Michelle Colburn, and Michelle is an artist and DC native. Um, her work has recently been included in group exhibitions at Hillier Art Space and the American University Museum in Washington, DC, and the Rona Rhonda Schiller Gallery in New York. She's currently an MFA candidate at the American University, and she will discuss the influence Leonardo Drew has had on her work. So I give you Michelle Colburn. Good evening. Um, I first saw uh, number seven, whoops, number 77 by Leonardo Drew in uh, 2000 at the Hirshhorn Museum in his direction show. And uh, it resonated with me greatly um, because of the scope of the work and the diversity of the manufactured and natural materials that uh, existed in the work. Um, I work with ready-mades. Um, I alter them, I change them, I manipulate them, paint them, mutilate them, and <laughs> deconstruct and reconstruct them, uh, bales, to create other works that conceptually addressed issues of identity and ethnicity. Um, so this is a piece that's made out of newborn diapers painted with acrylic. Um, and it's uh, painted to mimic the digital camouflage motif that we so often see. Um, for me, there came a point with the vocabulary of painting that I had to move on and uh, use and experiment with other modes of working. Um, so I'm interested in the point at which fashion and commodity meet military industrial complex and where indoctrination meets uh, commodity. This is the first piece that was three by six. I tend to work with um, smaller versions and then I made this large piece, which is six feet by 12 feet. Um, so one year ago, I was painting baby diapers uh, with military camouflage patterns. And uh, a year later, they're now in the marketplace and being manufactured as of August. Um, they're here in baby blue. Uh, so uh, that's just a detail of the work. And I was painting and painting and uh, also created fabric, um, designed fabric, so that's a baby blanket underneath these painted objects. I deviated a little bit from the divers and started working with baby formula cans and they're empty and um, redoing their labels and using a found palette that I found in somebody's yard in DC <laughs> or in the alley. Um, and th these got a little bit in your face, actually. And uh, the text deals with you know, directions for use and ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is the latest piece. Um, um, back to the diapers here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, there are associations of waste, obviously, and, and war as waste. Um, appear in these enlarged pixels of the digital man, uh, military camouflage patterns. And um, these guys are kind of presented as legions marching across or making a flag formation. Uh, the use of these materials to create new objects uh, or new surreal commodities um, would only have been possible with artists like Drew um, and Drew himself. Um, I might, not, I might have lacked a certain psychological freedom to even go here. <laughs> so right now, um, I'm, this, is a, this is a compilation of my palette at this point. Um, these are actual, I'm sorry, I can't see any um, time here. One minute, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm blinded by the light. Um, these are actual materials. Um, the, the onesie is what I made with the fabric I designed and the, the little blanket in the front, but these are actual products and I'm now deconstructing the products in the process of working with that. I'm shooting diapers and this kind of thing. Um, so that's where I'm going. Um, and last but not least, um, I'm making a short stop action film and this is the anti-hero. And this will be out in, I guess, April of next year. I'll finish it. It's a stop action, and it's titled, um, Mr. Potato Head Joins a Militia.
Okay. okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, next is Carrie Nobles. Carrie received her MFA from Howard University in 2011. She's trained as a painter and is currently working with uh, digital printmaking and photography, as well as painting. Uh, her work explores beauty, identity, and femininity. And Carrie will talk about her influence, Carrie Mae Weems. Hello. Oops, sorry. Besides the fact that we share the same first name, Carrie Mae Weems inspires me because of her innate ability to tell stories through her use of staged photography. I am also drawn to her work because she confronts issues of identity, beauty, as it relates to the African American experience, as well as this hovering of veil of femininity that seems to appear in her work. I was deeply inspired by the reoccurring image of the mirror in her work and her focus, focus on reflections. One of her most inspirational pieces for me came from her kitchen table series. That series in particular brought back personal memories of me and my mother getting ready at our kitchen table on Saturday afternoons, getting ready to go to church um, the next day. The kitchen transformed into our little vanity. We brought our comb and our brushes and we transformed ourselves. A lot of my work deals with that transformation of looking into um, the mirror and dressing up and having the vanity become our stage, our performance, to be whatever we would like to be at that moment. Many of Carrie Mae Weems' works are inspirational because they conjure a certain experience from my past. I can relate to her stories. She often uses the reflection to raise the issues of beauty and self-esteem. How a person seems, how a person's self-esteem through the reflection of the mirror. My work evokes questions about the effects of body image on the formation of identity for women and girls. Recently, I've developed a love for digital um, printmaking through the use of staged photography. My current digital series is titled Eternity, which documents the transformation of a young girl playing dress up, pretending and indulging in material things. This series draws, my, draw, draws from my own experiences and my own memories of how I used to play and pretend when I was younger. Digital printmaking for me is like painting. It brings me the same gratifications. I love collecting found objects and using them as tools when I paint, rather than using the traditional paintbrush. I combine layers of painting of paint using the found objects um, that brings different textures to the canvas. I parallel that experience um, to my experience with digital printmaking. I collect um, photographs and I combine them and I layer them and those images are uh, manipulated digitally. The finished product becomes an intriguing assemblage of images that are layered producing depth and a transparency within my work. The largest component um, to my process of digital printmaking is the use of stage photography. I create scenes by carefully placing objects in a particular space. I control the environment in my scenes and I can barely um, basically narrate any type of story that I want to create. That's another main reason why I find Carrie Mae Weems' work so influential. 
She uses stage photography to tell her story and to share her perspective on African-American folklore and history. Carrie Mae Weems inspires me to continue, continue to tell um, my story, to continue to um, share my experiences, and to continue to expand my talent in the areas I've never thought that I would ever go into. The end. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, next is Mazine Abdelhamid. Um, Abdel, uh, Mazine is a student at the Corcoran College of Art and Design right here, right now. Um, he works in uh, all sorts of different media, as you'll see, and it exp he explores themes of um, racial, sexual, and religious identity. And tonight he's gonna talk about um, his influences, uh, Caleb Lindsay and Glenn Ligon. So I give you Mazine. <laughs> Hey guys. Uh, <laughs> so uh, one of my first influences was an indirect influence. Um, I wanted to explore uh, sexuality, identity, and religion based on my background and upbringing. Um, I started doing this piece, uh, well I thought about the theme of it years ago and uh, I just started it recently. Um, here it is. Uh, so basically, um, I was told that sometimes people are thinking the same thing, and I had not heard of uh, Lindsay for a while. And um, I realized how I was referencing him indirectly and unintentionally, and I went back and looked at his work, and um, I saw themes that he explored in mine using a character and identity and other references like that. It's just another shot. Um, and uh, could you cue the video? So that was a, a clip from a video I did about a year ago, um, long before I've heard of Lindsay. And um, I liked how I made the connection between him and I, where there was this character invented in drag and uh, referencing something else, in this case Dadaism, and a playing off the idea of Lady Gaga, someone who's well known, I guess. Um, so my next influence is uh, Glenn Ligon, and, um, I had written an essay about him last year, and uh, I enjoyed his use of light and text, and I thought that was wonderful. And I thought of um, uh, using identity, which is an identity-based piece entitled Artist Black. <laughs> um, so it's about being a black artist or any other artist in, who is a minority, a woman artist, Hispanic artist. Um, I wanted to use standardized text um, on Photoshop, and this is digital, where um, basically it was about trying to overcome that label you're given as a minority artist. Um, and then I thought of directly influencing, uh, directly referencing him using light by shining a light on the issue that was on my mind. Um, yeah, 
So this is it. Thank you. I did in 1996. And so I create portraits on typical, everyday, useful brown paper bags. And my brown paper bag portraits, if you will, deal with the practice or a practice that went on in the black community um, several decades ago where one would actually compare one's skin complexion to a paper bag. And if your skin were lighter than the paper bag, then you gain entrance into an organization or a school or whatever, whatever, whatever the um, event might be. And so initially, I only photographed black women of different complexions, and they would talk about their life and their particular skin colors. And so every woman or child will make a statement about what it's like um, in living in their skin. And then I realized that every culture, every society has something within it in which um, intraracial prejudices are introduced. And so I then broadened it to include, um, you know, everybody. So I travel quite a bit. I travel internationally quite a bit. And um, I'm going to go back a little bit before I talk about that piece. And so um, you'll see, like, if I go back to this woman, um, if you can see the title, 9-11, um, basically. And I was teaching at a, at a college in New York. And this woman's name happened to be Asma. But because we kept hearing Osama bin Laden quite a bit, I kept calling her Osama by mistake. And um, anyway, she corrected me. But anyway, she talked about what it was like being a Muslim woman um, right after 9-11. Um, and so this piece, as you can see, is based on the famous painting, The Scream, and um, this one is actually, she's screaming because she's of brown complexion, and that if she were to go through the brown paper bag test, then she would, um, you know, be traumatized, if you will. And I included a few gallery pieces, so you get a sense of, of, of I guess, an installation. And before I forget, I haven't mentioned much about Cara Walker, and certainly you know that she works with paper and, and brown paper silhouettes, or I'm sorry, black paper silhouettes. And, um, and so rather than saying that Walker's work influences mine, because we're, we're very close in age, um, we're both college professors, so I would say more that our work parallels one another. And, um, and certainly we're working with paper, and so paper as a fine art form, I think, is um, unusual. And so this is a, um, some of the more recent works that I've been doing because my, the brown papers, I actually run through a, um, a printer, and the paper bags don't always, or the, the portraits don't always come out very well. And so something told me not to throw out the, the ones that don't come out well. And so I had a dream that I would make this relief sculpture out of those misused or those bad prints. And so these, these are, if I go back to this one, it is, this is the first one, and she is a bag lady stomping out racism. And so these are, the, again, the recycled paper bags that are scrunched up into a relief. This is um, a bag lady stomping out classism. So like Carl Walker, both of our works deal a lot, a lot with gender issues, racial issues, and, um, and just putting on modern day viewpoints on those works, or those viewpoints, if you will. This is bag lady kicking out sexism. And if you can see, um, again, you can see some of the wordings from the, the statements that the women that I photograph make. And so she was photographed in Jerusalem. And I'm speeding through here because my time is going up quickly. And so this woman has vitiligo. And she, she joked with me and said that her husband gets um, the best of both worlds, a black woman and a white woman there. <laughs> And this is see no color, hear no color, speak no color, and it is on brown paper. And I thought I would end with this one. This is called Dirty Laundry because my work speaks to, uh, you know, about primarily black women or, or and blacks and their skin biases. Um, I've been accused of airing our dirty laundry. And that's it.
Thank you, Laurie. Um, next is Gary Lockwood, also known as Freehand Profit. And Gary graduated from the Corcoran as well in 2005. He is an artist and graphic designer who has collaborated with hip hop artists and clothing designers. And in 2005, he founded the clothing line Profit Incorporated. So his series, Branding Wars, transformed sneakers into gas masks and other wartime objects. So he will discuss the influence Hank Willis Thomas has had on his work. So I'll give you Gary. Uh, forgive me if I stumble through this. I'm having critique flashbacks as we speak. Um, I'm currently working in LA. Uh, my work focuses on examining our consumer nature despite being a society at war. Uh, it's not intended to condo uh, condemn or condone, but instead more as a realignment of sorts. Uh, the body of work is entitled The Branding Wars and consists mainly of gas masks made from sneakers. Uh, there have been a number of artists from the 30 Americans exhibit that have inspired me. The most influential of them is Hank Willis Thomas. Thomas's work uses branding and the language of advertising to discuss race and identity. His use of advertising as a visual language allows us all to tap into the discussion and form our own understanding of the work. The saturation of advertising continues to grow as more and more forms of advertising infiltrate our everyday lives. The propaganda-esque nature of today's advertisements are part of the inspiration behind the Branding Wars series. I use similar techniques in my work to feed our love of the object. I say object here, not meaning the mask itself, but an object of desire. We as a whole have grown to love objects the way we need food. Our wants have become needs. We see a product advertised and convince ourselves that we need it. Once we have it, we love it. Nothing new there, it's materialism at its finest. That's not entirely evil to me. Those same forces help sell artwork, create jobs, and can add to our quality of life. The Branding Wars series aims to address how absurd materialism can become. The underlying narrative that develops through the series describes a world that's been destroyed by all the things we've been trained to fear. Natural disasters, terrorism, war, greed, and violence. Government becomes either non-existent or completely ineffective, leaving people to form tribes of branded loyalists. Typical post-apocalyptic story, except our materialism becomes our defining and dividing factor. Leading back to the absurd, because what's more absurd than be con being concerned with whether your gas mask is made from retro Jordans or Chuck Taylors? Yet, if we're honest with ourselves, we make comparable decisions every day. I, for example, buy store brand food so I can buy name brand sneakers. <laughs> it's not easy to admit, but going back to Hank Willis Thomas, who said in an interview with Juxtapose, Americans have to accept the critique of our privilege. Perhaps the most influential thing about Thomas to me is his effort to reach people outside of the art community, people who wouldn't normally be in an art gallery. This has been a personal goal of mine that dates back to my years at the Corcoran. I have worked hard to find a way to convey a dichotomous message clearly through a visual language. Because of my background in graphic design, I knew there were clear design languages out there. I looked at different ways of blurring the line between design and art. This gradually became my use of personal and corporate branding that can be seen in my artwork. Uh, when I discovered the work of Thomas, I was impressed with how well he used branding to reach a wider and more understanding audience. My appropriation of objects comes from hip hop culture, which has been a major influence on my life and work. My understanding of a DJ's ability to take a piece of music and sample and remix it until it takes on a whole new life plays into my artistic process. In an almost literal way, I take these existing branded and desired objects and destroy what they are in the hopes of what they might become. This approach allows me to also address the commercial, commercial nature of hip hop has developed over the years from within my own community. These brands can represent status symbols within the world of hip hop as well as reflect perceptions of identity and race as they do in Thomas's series, Branded. His pieces use brands like Jordan and Timberland to address issues of stereotypes and violence, both historical and modern. In his series, Unbranded, he took images of blackness in advertisements and removed the text. The sources dated from 1968 to the present and together gave us an insight into how corporate America influences identity. The issue of identity and preconceived notions of identity are topics I attempt to tackle in my own work. My generation, and even more so the generations to follow, form our understanding of identity by how we brand ourselves, 
by how we brand ourselves. We gain more understanding, or at least gain the perception of understanding based on how we present ourselves, what brands we wear, and the trends that we choose to follow. It's all too common to find youth and young adults that have built their sense of identity through, uh, based on style instead of substance. The Branding Wars masks are a hyperbolic example of this, literally masking the face of the wearer and replacing it with the branded identity. And that's it. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Um, next is Jamia Richmond Edwards, who is a painter and an MFA candidate at Howard University. Um, Jamia's work has recently been featured in exhibitions at Parrish Gallery and DCAC in Washington, um, Gary Murtis in Baltimore, and Peltz Gallery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and she is currently in a group show at Rush Arts in New York City. So Jamia will discuss the influence Carrie James Marshall has had on her work. So I'll give you Jamia. Good evening. Okay. Carrie James Marshall has not only influenced my work aesthetically but theoretically as well. We are both interested in examining the complexities of the black image within our work. This particular body of work is inspired by my aunt who was murdered five years ago. My aunt who battled drugs most of her life couldn't quite shake the habit and it ultimately led to her, her death. So in my reaction to her death, I became interested in how society viewed her as this very ugly person. So that led to my interest in the archetype, the ugly mother. But instead of creating this grotesque or ugly figure, I wanted to do something quite opposite. I wanted the figure to appear very beautiful and alluring, but yet I was in on, it, on their secret. I understood their burdens that they carry. So as you can see, the pieces are highly influenced by fashion. And if I can go back, let me see, uh oh, uh oh. 